Good morning, everybody. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, can you all see my screen? I just want to make sure we all can see the screen. Thanks. So we can see the screen. So welcome to this webinar. I'd like to share today with you some of my background and experience about how to maximize the value of your mind and asset. And I'm going to talk about a geometrical approach. I would like to state clearly that geometallurgy and how to maximize the value of your assets is not a, 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 a single uh, area of process engineering or geology or mining. It's a combination of all free and finance. So I, my experience I want to show you is how we as process engineers and as mechanical engineers, mining engineers, geologists can work together to actually get to the best value for our clients and the best value for our assets and mine. So uh, I'm going to go through a few of the slides with you today and I hope you can um, see it clearly and then we can have a chat afterwards and you can put your questions down uh, on the chat, chat forum and we can chat about it after the presentation. So basically, um, as you can see, in a in a in a mine design, they they move the geologist starts usually with block models and block models on a resource model, and as they develop those block models, they actually develop it very much along the line of uh, grade and uh, the value of the metal that they want to extract, and all those colors mean something. And then I will go through the discussion as I go on. But I mean, these are the type of pictures that you will get out of some of these block and resource models. So what you need to have a chat about this this morning is about the definition of geometallurgy, the value proposition we see in there, the, how it's done. We can talk about a bit of green fields, brown fields. I've got some four case studies in different areas, and uh, and I will look at some issues hampering the approach, which is problematic for us and why we don't use it more, and some concluding remarks. So we'll go through all of that during this morning. Perception. Uh, I always start with this because it's an important aspect. I mean, if you look at that picture, I mean, what I look at and what you look at might be different things. So we, perception can be dangerous and costly. And what we do in life is we look at data and information and values, and we actually perceive some value in that number or in the, the way we do things. And how I do it and how somebody else do it is different. And the problem is we all have to look from the same the same way at a picture. We all have to actually understand that that picture is similar to all of us. And that's a very important part of, of, of the, the approach in geometallurgy. So what is geometallurgy? Geometallurgy is basically the understanding of any metallurgical, or we can call it process parameters, variability, and it's based on geoscientific information such as the mineralogy, the grade, geochemistry, and lithology. Now, if you look at that first part, the mineralogy, the grade, the geochemistry, and the phology, they all things which is really driven by geologists, not mineralogy to a certain extent, but the rest is really driven in the exploration stated by geologists. So that information is usually quite available. Um, they might have a few, a few drill holes, or a few, maybe hundreds, or you know, five or 20, or whatever. What they will do is, is those drill holes will be separated in meter by meter sections, and you'll have a lot of this information in each one of those meters. So you can have a, a lot of data points uh, with that information. So what the geometallurgy do is, is aim to model the variability within an ore body to allow the op optimal exploitation. So if you want to if you want to move from a resource to reserve, it's probably the best area in geometallurgy and then from reserve to production. That's where geometallurgy gets used a lot. So you can actually put more value onto certain uh, geoscientific information that's available. So the knowledge of metallurgical variabilities requires the collection of samples. And we have to actually go through the sub subset of that information. So if you look at that, if you don't understand it, you can't improve it. So if you just look at the, the top line, it shows you any normal mining operation, draw blast, load, haul, crush, you know, you can float, grind, smelt, leach, whatever you want to do. Just, 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 just an example. It stayed there. There is usually one process that's stopping you from making more money now. Now, that, this is a point of greatest leverage for you to improve. And how do you find that? 
for projects, you can choose a bottleneck. It should be the most expensive part. Maybe if it's a brownfield, greenfield. For operations, it's very much what data is available, where's the bottlenecks, optimization type of work. How do you exploit it? You brainstorm, you look at strategies, you see what can I get out of that. And that's where I would like to focus a lot of, a, a lot of a attention is how to exploit that. And then how to predict the improvement. So you use the test work information and you try to find that link. And these two areas are very, quite, a, quite a bit of importance. So in any, one, any project, you always like to determine what is the leverage and then go on and show what can I do to actually, at the end of the day, use that information to exploit it to the benefit financially for my, for my company or, or my project. So all body knowledge, what's all body knowledge? All body knowledge is a key to business. It drives exploration, it drives evaluation, it drives exploitation and it drives extraction. They all, is uh, it's a driver. So what is all body knowledge? Geology is very much your mineralogy, your geochemistry, your assaying, the things that I've mentioned. Engineering parameters, it can be something like unconfined uh, un un compressive strengths of rock mass ratings, uh, metallurgical properties, it can be something like gravity results, formal index results, leaching results, it can be any metallurgical property. So there's, there's quite a few. So you have quite a few different things that you can add. Now, most of our resource modeling gets done on the geology. And then when it gets to reserve, there's certain metallurgical properties being added, but it's usually just things like um, leaching curves or, or maybe a grind establishment, if you're lucky, or sometimes it's uh, uh, extractions for various lithologies, et cetera. But very small amount of metallurgical properties get used in that next stage of modeling, and, and, and specifically less engineering properties. I do use some of these uh, unconfined strengths, et cetera, in, in some of the reserve modeling as well. So understanding the ore body, you can set your expectations. So you can ex understand the variability of your grade, the nature of what domains is there, is it fresh ore, oxide ore, transition, is it hard, soft, the size and the processing method. So they all is understanding part of it, and that's where you will start off with your with your old study. So if you look at a, a value proposition, you look at it, and, and basically what you have, you have test data. They can be geological, I've mentioned to you, mineralogical, which can be sometimes done by the process guys and sometimes done by geologists, and then the metallurgical parameters. But they are the test information that you've done from test work. You have a resource block model, and then you have a mine plant data with existing or, or plants. So you've got the geometallurgy in the middle where you actually have correlations and variability. And you use that information together, or sometimes just that information, sometimes combine on that, to optimize the design parameters and to actually mine, to help the mine process if it's existing, and that optimizes the value. And all these can be used in, you know, all this is talking about reserve and what is the value of the mine. And that's where you, you actually adding all this information to actually make sure you get some dollars out of the whole process. Um, it's for our scientists and engineers very important to have interesting geomorphological uh, properties and things like that. That is scientific and engineering knowledge. But at the end of the day, for your client and for a mine and for a current brownfields or even a, and a future greenfields operation, it's all about the optimum value. So if you look at that, this is a very simplistic um, picture, but a very interesting picture because it actually shows you that you do have integrated data, an integrated database. And usually it's run by the resource guys, the geologists, they have this database and what they do is they actually define geological domains. They use the information with the one meter information they have from the drill course and drilling and all that information. They actually define these geologic, geological domains. What we're saying is, can't we add in something, and this is just a simplistic way, from the metallurgical test work or process work and add it to that and then you get some metallurgical domains. Now, to be honest with you, a geological domain gives you value of the metal. A metallurgical domain gives you optimum value when you extract it. And that's what you want to aim at. So that will look different from the geological domains. And if you can add something, you can add value to your, to your, to your old process. If you can't, 
you still do what you had done in the past and you try to make sure that you get the best value when you go forward. So how do we do it? Um, if you look at green fields on the left, you, you will do experimental design. You basically will uh, look at test work and you interpret those test work, ensure test work results reflect the actual achieved results, representativity, variability, all those things you look at. You add that information into geometrical modeling, where you get the mineral variability modeling, and you can do some statistic analysis of your test work data to ensure that uh, you know what you've done is probably uh, a real picture. It's not just a snapshot. Uh, on brownfields established operations, you know you can look at data mining. They have a lot of information available from from sensors and other pieces of equipment, which you can actually go and use. You can. Try to optimize that process, looking at your current process, where's the bottlenecks, as I mentioned, and then you can do it with reconciliation, getting back to your reserve models and mining models and actually apply that. So you can optimize the mining schedules, you can optimize the processing schedules, etc. So if you look at these steps of geometallurgy, and I just want to explain to you, you know, basically stage one is very much multivariate spatial domain definition. It's very geological based, then you get minerals processing sample selection, stage two. You go parameter determination, et cetera, as they go along the various stages. But a lot of your sampling and testing is done in stage one to three, okay, where your advanced exploration and evaluation takes place. When you go to stage four, where you actually get the model definition and then spatial model generations in, in, in this geometrical modeling, if you're still doing sampling and testing here, you're actually just pushing out that information to a later stage, but it's still valuable. Uh, it doesn't say you missed the boat, but uh, it's very good to actually do a lot of your sampling and testing in this early stages. So this is a good um, schematic, and I like this schematic because it gives you a, a bit of information from geologists, the mining guys, and the processing guys all together. So it tells you about typical data, typical testing, drill holes, amount, and look, this is estimations. And I mean, to be honest with you, it depends on your on your size of your company, mid-tier, junior, or a big company. And uncertainty levels is, is, is very important. But what you see here at the bottom here, this is geometrical mapping and then modeling. What usually will happen is during scoping stages and PFS, you will do a, quite a bit of that mapping. You try to find out if there's some ways that you can actually do that. So at the end of a PFS, you usually will have a reserve model. And that's where you would actually start with that modeling and see if you can incorporate some of that mapping into a modeling process. So initially you look at grade block models, then it move into met block models, and then you go to the mine plan. So all, all this is a flow, part of your flow sheet development. So as I develop, is, is, as a process engineer, we want to develop flow sheets. So we develop, develop flow sheets and we optimize those flow sheets to the best of our abilities. But if, if the flow sheet is going to give you variable results with variable domains and variable lithologies, and you can quantify those, you can actually bring that into your resource models and in your, for your reserve models and, and make it a geometrical block model, which can be applied to the mine plan. And that is actually where you're aiming at, is to actually get some, this part is very important. You will continue with this modeling during your BFS or DFS and during the operations itself. And, and basically you will model, test, make sure you're there, you get plant data, you can actually, I'll show you some examples where you can actually go and see, did I get what I've predicted I'm gonna get? And uh, your accuracy is also much more accurate when you get to those stages. So if you just look at a, 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 a resource model, it basically gives you something like this. I mean, you can look at the ore and there's a few pictures of the ore. And in this case with a copper envelope, it basically shows you you know, this gives you different grades and you can have a, a different colors. In this case, most of it was a, that 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 uh, uh, fruit uh, grades, for example, but it's very much great orientated, as I mentioned in the beginning. It gives you a nice picture, gives you everything, but it's all about the metal. Uh, it's not anything really about the associations or even the extractions of that metal. It's about where's the metal? Is it there? and it have to be accurate. So the resource model is very important as it have to be accurate because if the metal is not there, whatever other things you've got, it's not gonna work. So that's important, but it doesn't tell me anything on processing or designing a plant or doing anything else with that. 
So if you look at it, if you start, for example, this was by Montoya et al. in 2011, they actually, uh, you know, just showed and they started looking at things and they said, okay, I mean, I can actually look at a block and I take these, this block and they said, uh, we, we got some AB value, AB is, 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 is SAG, SAG uh, uh, indicators, it's a SAG model indicators, it talks you about your break, impact breakage. And we had some AB values and we actually can take this block and we can show that in this block, we're going to have certain areas which is going to be very difficult and hard. This is going to show us that you're probably going to be a problematic impact. We're not going to get the same throughput because it's harder material, um, uh, but it's small quantities. Now, if you if you if you look at this picture and you think, okay, it's, this is a whole resource. Uh, this might tell you this is part is, for example, hard. This part is soft. You can actually, when you do mining, they can decide where they want to mine, how they're going to mine, and etc. This is going to be harder. Maybe the throughput is going to be impacted. You can make certain decisions processing and mining wise in this regard. Same with Bormel Linux. They've done the same. They talk about grindability. And that is the type of information that you can add to make your resource model a bit more valuable to the mining guys and to future process operations. Now, as I mentioned before, it's not something that you can do really by yourself. I mean, as process a geologists, we will look, they will look at all the cringing block models, as I explained, and they do that, and they very focus on that. As process engineers, we very focus usually on basically at the end of the day, looking at our metallurgical parameters so that we can design the correct plot, so that the PDC is correct, the flow sheet is correct. If you look at the mining guys, they're looking at how can they actually make stability, you know, if it's open, but make sure the angles are stable, make sure the way they mine is correct, make sure they add, get the best value out of the mine in grade, et cetera, et cetera. Each one look at it separately. Geomological approaches, you actually combine that information, you give them each other more information so that at the end of the day, that the optimal results can be achieved. It's not a single thing, but you will work in your little silos initially to actually achieve it, but that's where you start talking to each other and getting that information. So if you look at this, for example, uh, I'm just gonna take this, just make sure it's there. So what you find, what's the outcome? What do you wanna try to achieve? So what you would like to achieve is to get some other relationship. So the, de the develop a correlation or a relationship between a small number of measurable physical properties and parameters, and then use that in actually say if there's a relationship. So let's, let's give you an example, for example, and I'll, I'll show you in some of the case studies. If there's a relationship between, for example, um, asset consumers and and recoveries, you know, that relationship you can add in because in your geological model, you'll have all the, the, the numbers of those asset consumers. You, you understand they're there. So what's very important for process guys to understand what is tested during the geological domain stage, uh, what type of things. It's usually two chemistry, there's a bit of mineralogy and there's a few bit of extra, it depends, but that's information. So, if I have these, like, let's say the 100 data points, and that's what I've done my test work, and I can find that there's a correlation with 1,000 data points from a geological work. I know that if I put a line through here, there is definitely a, a relationship. I can use that relationship to actually into a geometrical model, and that's uh, the main aim of this. The same with density plots. I mean, density plots is something I don't really knew about even, you know, through my career. And I mean, I know, you know, over 40 years, I spent a lot of time, to, you know, starting in Anglo doing developing diagnostic leaching and things like that, which was to understand mineralogy. But I mean, then, you know, my world opened in the, in the 2000 when I heard about density plots and, you know, things like that. Density plots tells you also, you know, where's most of your samples and, and, and where's most of that concentrated into a, a certain area. So in this case, for example, I know I've tested quite a bit of that. That's the most biggest density. So I can actually look at this and at the end of the day decide, you know, um, is it statistically applicable or not? And that helps me as well, because otherwise it can be a few snapshots, which is not always applicable. So the outcome, if, if that is, if you have a block model, 
it is actually to add things to that block model, to transform it, form it and to actually make it much more accurate and much more applicable and, and it actually give confidence to the decision makers with regard to the resource and the reserve and the future mine plan. So what do we do it's before I start with a few examples? Sampling for grade or metallurgical properties and a pinch of successful mining operation. Poor plant performance can often be related to poor quality or numbers of MET samples, poor or inadequate MET testing, and often both of them. So from your scoping study to your DFS, there's always have to be more samples tested. And the more samples you can get test, the more you can get a correlation, statistical uh, correlation between this, the, these values. So DFS usually requires large scale testing if possible or more tests. But the last two is very important. I mean, this last two sentences, we said first class test work on poor samples is no good. I can use the best lab it's overall, but my samples I've selected is not very good it's not gonna give me any good value. And I promise you that happens a lot. But poor sampling will cost you also a lot of time and cost, and it's a major project risk. So at the end of the day, you know, a lot of people will ask me, how many samples do I need to test this? How many do, you know, uh, logical test was expensive, process test was expensive, how, you know what? At the end of the day, it's very much a function of good samples, good tests, and if you have a few of those, it will be much more valuable than hundreds of samples, bad, bad samples, and good tests or other way around. So it's important to realize that sampling is as important and choosing those samples, and also realizing when you actually, the biggest um, probably um, risk to geomological modeling is when you actually uh, blend. If you take samples, you blend that quite intensively, you're actually taking a lot of variability out of it. And that takes a lot of statistical and, 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 and parameter variability out of it. So blending uh, is a difficult part in, in a sense. And a lot of test work, people like to go into blending samples. That's why your variability test work and all that others is sometimes very much more, more important in the sense of getting something out of the out of the whole uh, test work program in the, in the sense of geological parameters and modeling. So let's look at a few. So the outcome at the end of the day, if you look at this, is basically the outcome is to, to actually optimize the mining part. So And you can have different scenarios where you can say, what can I do in this part to actually get the best scenario for me? And this is where we play a major role in the process. So let's look at some case studies. I mean, it's, it's a, quite a few interesting case studies. But I mean, um, in this case, <clears throat> which was a nickel uh, 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 project, it shows that during test work, it shows that silicon head grade identified, was identified as a driver for predicting beneficiation performance. And if you look at that with the samples, or a lot of samples, you sort of see that silicon head grade, silica head grade, which is, you know, not something that you will ever think was there's a correlation, but versus nickel, the upgrade factor for nickel, and it, you could see there was definitely a relationship for different deposits as well. Uh, you could do that, and you could see that uh, aluminium upgrade, nickel, they had various upgrade factors, and there was even a relationship with mass pool um, from that. Some leach work done showed that there were a strong relationship actually between nickel extraction and the extraction of the acid consuming elements in that deposit. And there were some of the relationships that's been found. So basically what, what, what uh, the mining engineer then done was when we found this, these relationships, so, so basically what we've done, just give you an example, silica head rate was in the database. It was the information was there from the geological information. When we start looking at if there's a relationship between any of our nickel upgrades and nickel recoveries, et cetera, and leach versus that database, which, which we knew at asset consumers, which was a problem in nickel, uh, we actually got these relationships as process guys with the geologists. Uh, 
So when we'd done that, we said, okay, to the mining guys, okay, take these, this information and see what type of scenarios you can come up with in the mining side. And what they done is that they actually took case one where they say there was no beneficiation, but they just optimized the schedule. So basically that was a case study if I didn't have any relationship, no relationships available, they will just optimize the schedule and cut off grade. So that gives them, that is 100%, that's a baseline. So case two, they say there was some beneficiation. We use the information that's gained, given to us with regards to nickel upgrade, and we optimize the schedule and cut off grade that way. And you could see the discount cash flow and operating cash flow was, was quite a bit different. And then case three, where the beneficiation with reduced asset decision. So to make sure that the asset decision uh, is not the driving force in this case and the, due to the asset consumers. And it also shows you that there was a difference from the hundred. So it tells you basically what's your, what is the beneficiation in that and you can actually make a decision if you can use that to get better values. And all cases consider the same as a part capacity. So the mining guys can use that information with information from the process guys to actually making calls with regards to what might be the process or what might be the best way to go ahead. And out of that, they actually, some of the results that the mining guys came up with was leach, leach feed versus period, leach nickel grade as it goes as you mine. It tells you about the nickel recovery initial they optimize the nickel recovery for obviously financial purposes, and it shows you how it flattens off with the different cases. So you can see what happened with your nickel recover nickel grade with different cases. You can see what happened with your leach feed with different cases, uh, where case one is always your base case and, and your cash flow. And that's that's the one that's probably driving the decision making tool at the end of the day for the for the company. Case two is a, is a very interesting case study because it's actually, if you look at this uh, 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 top left-hand uh, graph, you'll see there's a lot of black spots at the back. And that, that black spots is test work and plant data over many, many, many years on an operation. And it's plant data over many years. And what it shows is it shows there's a relationship between a certain nickel versus uh, a sulfide relationship versus actual, actual nickel recovery on a, on, a, on, a, on a plot. And what it shows you, you know, is that that black spots had that relation. So that when you actually go and expand maybe that, uh, um, what you call it, uh, uh, mine, you want maybe use a new resource, uh, a new pit or expand the pit or go different or go underground, etc. What they do is you actually test colored spot is new cutoff test work is and you're actually testing the, the the information. And what happened in this case, for example, you see that with the with the with the expansion and the new material tested, you know, it 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 actually moves the this whole graph that this you had tested at lower relationships and tested at more higher rates. And what it actually shows you, a lot of it is still in that same area that we have. So you could basically expand or extrapolate this relationship that's available currently on the plant and say, yes, it's going to work for the new cutoff. It's going to work for the new uh, uh, areas of the new uh, um, new cutback or underground or new deposit. Now, what is good about this, if you have existing data, you can add new metallurgical data to it and say, yes, you still got the same correlation. Maybe these color points might have been like that. And then it tells you this is going to react totally different from what you're expecting in the past. And that will tell you something about a brownfields operation where you're going as well. This was also very interesting. If you look at this, um, their average throughput was probably around about uh, 1,100 uh, tons per annum um, dry throughput through their, through their uh, process plant. Now, what it shows them that when they define those into different types of, of material, they actually shown that the milling circuit can be constrained due to the different types of material. So this was all about the processing plant, processing circuit or the flotation circuit. This was all about their milling circuit. And that showed you that the depends on what type of area you're gonna mine in, and what type of block you're going to use, this information can be then added to their block models to define 
either a blending strategy or if I'm only getting type 2 material in, uh, I'm going to be fine with the current plant. If I get type 4 material in, I'm going to be more than fine. But if I get type 2 material in, I'm not going to make the, the fruit put that I want to make. This one is a is an interesting one where um, guys took a, a, a bit of a, uh, you know, the, the financial guys. This, the, the first one was done by a combination of people. The last modeling was done by mining guys, that scenario case. The second one was very much a processing orientated thing so that you can look at what you can do with human logical information and, and, and relationships for future throughputs and things like that. The third one is very much where you have a financial analysis guys who will actually do and use, a, use the information financial analysis and they're adding it to their reserve models. So what it does in, in this case, it shows you that you have two, you have a base case mine, which is a, the gray, gray lines, that's the gray lines, that's the base case mine sort of financial modeling. And then what they've done, they added the Jumet model. Okay, and the Jumet model gave what's a red line and that gives a different output in regards to discount cash flow. And what it shows you in different areas, in this case, for example, there will be lower cash flow as a result of mining material with lower recoveries and throughput. In this case, there will be higher cash flows from mining due to higher recoveries, higher throughput. So it, it tells you, you know, these cash flow scenarios is important for the guys to actually develop, uh, you know, with what they want. They might want to go for the base case and say, I still want this base case, uh, this is more important to me. Or they might say, oh, I'll rather go with this one because they are going to actually have higher cash flows initially. And that's what I want. Now, if you just do it on grade, you don't get these same really pictures. You get different pictures. And that's a problem with regards to just looking at non geometrical inputs. Case study four is, a, is an interesting one. Uh, it's basically a, a, a copper molly deposit. And basically what it done is, is in, in, in test work, and a quite extensive test work has that been done on this, this, this uh, uh, what you call it, uh, a project. Um, it's been, there's a paper by King and McDonald, they actually published some of this, and this, this relationship, some of that was developed, where we've done some of the test work and the process modeling and metrics, so that's where we work with them. But what you see is that actually, they found a relationship between calcite, and acid consumptions, and also between calcium and acid consumption. So there were some relationships that they do that, there. and that and some of them had good correlation, some of that had worse correlation. But we're using, they were using this as well as, if I go to the next slide, the throughput. There's a relation between the bond work index and the throughput, as well as the power cost and the bond work index. So all of these relationships they plugged into their system. Uh, and into their uh, um, their um, mine scheduling, and the model was then used to for the mine scheduling to determine the high and low throughput rates and high and low asset consumption ore zones. So they immediately knew if I'm hitting this ore zone, it's going to be a high asset consumption. My operating cost is going to increase. Uh, that's what's going to happen. I'm going to have lower. I might have the same recoveries, but I'm going to have lower cash flows, etc. So they could use all that information to actually determine. What will happen if they hit that areas or the certain blocks or areas in, in, their, in their mining schedule? Uh, in this case, what it helped them as well is, is to actually show that, that you know, they, uh, there were certain areas of that where they actually had to blend some of that away and they actually had to have a bigger resource to do that. So it ended up them going and drill more to find a bigger resource to actually make sure that those asset consumptions didn't play a major role and a major operating cost issue with regards to the way they're operating that, that future deposit or mine. So in this case, you know, and, and, and what was interesting about this one is to be honest with you, 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 you very seldom find very good hardness relationships versus, fruit, versus um, any other uh, 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 um, metals. But if you get the hardness and power costs and you can add it, you can add that versus the fact that you actually also have um, calcite based acid consumers. And we knew that the acid consumers were the softer material. So then that gives you an indication of what the throughput will be as well. So there was a, a third link that you had to add to that modeling uh, process. So 
these four examples with good examples the last one was very much a, a project through the study phases that have developed the first one was very much one where it was a project or study phase where there's different scenarios that can play a role they can do it in your plant with existing systems as case study two so these all give you an example of what can be used your biggest risk in all of that is in the fact that you at the end of the day have to realize that you need to spend some time to find these relationships now to be honest with you a lot of process guys don't have the time so it's 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 very important that you go and discuss that with some of the geological guys or or even modeling guys your statistical guys it's to do statistical analysis and say that you think there's some of these relationships available and you let's have a look at it and and as soon as you start the seeing some of these relationships developing you can go and then look at it is there enough test samples available was there outliers was it just for a hard ore or was it just for soft ore can you apply it right through the variability or not or can you apply it only on certain domains etc and that way you find that a lot of that you just discard to be honest so it's not all relationships that you find that you actually can use uh, um, but any relationship is always good to actually have something that's available for you that you can actually uh, in the future do something with that. So to, to, to end this is a lack of appropriate metallurgical ore body domain definition is a big thing. There's a lack of um, rigorous protocols for sampling selection um, and adequate numbers of samples. I mean, we still have small amount of samples as I showed in the beginning and you can make really statistical errors there if you don't really understand the samples and where they come from and what's their limitations a lack of uniforming approach integrating these parameters and uh, i don't always think there should be a uniform approach right across the industry uh, but a uniform approach against the team which is the geologists and processing guys and the mining guys everyone there should be a uniform approach i want to do it i want to try to do it uh, if one is say oh, i don't care about it and the other one say oh, you you're not going to get that uniform approach and if you do have a uniform approach it can be very valuable. A lack of accepted statistical methodology for spatial distribution, other things, you know, you know, how do you use it and 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 very much into the modeling guys' domains. Um, other things is need for increasing testing requires customized low cost and easy tests. You know, it's you know, some tests is very cheap and easy, and you can actually get quite a bit of good value out of it and money out of it and that's important and that's quite valuable um, but if it's expensive tests like smc tests and Bormel index tests and things like that it becomes very expensive to do more tests with. more qualified methods proxy parameters and then schedule based on human load models will in turn be subject to other things like variation in geological control mining issues with regards to pit designs and inclines and things like that there's other things that actually will kill sometimes a part of that geological information. Uh, but, you know, that is where you actually have to go to to find out if it's valuable or not. So concluding thoughts, the results of a well-designed geological program can be used for a better flow sheet design. You can make it more flexible. You can think about it how you want to do it. Better use of algorithm for throughput and recovery. So you don't have just one number for your reserve. You have algorithms there that's the first thing it should have uh, different algorithms that say different material with different properties will have different recoveries or maybe etc maybe more refractory as we go along now that is the important part better use of mining schedule and plant for optimizing your plant performance better plant equipment design and sizing if you know where you're going and you understand your mine plan uh, so the process designers and the Guys who design the process engineers, us as, as, as process engineers can actually look at that more in intense and make sure we design the plant for optimized performance right through the life. Optimize forecasting, maximize your MPV, that's an important part. Control product quality and identify and maximize environmental impacts if you find things like that. So, I mean, for example, that asset con con and reduce risk with other phases, as I mentioned, but that identify environmental impacts is important because the one i was mentioning about of the asset consumers that as those asset consumers is environmental issues as well and if you can minimize that and actually by the fact that you actually don't have to treat some of that that's a very important part of 
of, uh, of environmental risk as well. And then geometallurgy is an integrated part of our scoping of pre -feasible. It's It's part of your feasibility. It should be, you should always have an open mind to try to do it. You should talk to the geology guys and you should try to incorporate any process parameters as you can, as far as possible and see if you can find these things. If you can't, you try it. But if you can, it will be very valuable. A well-planned test work program, at early phases, especially if you think you're going to be able to achieve that. For example, that one I've talked about, the brownfields, they had a relationship. So what you're going to do is you want to try to see if that relationship is still applicable. So your test work program will focus on that relationship. And you're not going to do a lot of other things as soon as, and if you find the same relationship, you know that is still working for you. And the better this integration between all these areas, the better the outcome for the whole process and the outcome for the client. So as design engineers or as geologists or as mining planners, we all work together to give the, the client the best outcome and the best MPV. And, and, and that's what we should achieve with this approach. Um, some people will, will just work on the geometrical things and, and that's their research areas, etc. For us, it's very much how you can use that information to the benefit of the client and to the benefit of an optimal design and man, mind plan. So that was the end of it. Any questions? Is there any questions on on uh, from the from the audience that anybody wants to talk about? Uh, yes, Leon. There are some questions from the audience. Uh, the first one is: uh, uh, you talk about these relationships. Uh, what are the most common or easiest types of relationships we should look for? Um, <clears throat> The easiest one is usually to try to find a relationship. I mean, a, a lot of your geoscientific knowledge is very much about um, uh, metals and other minerals present. And that information is quite uh, uh, easily available. And it's always to see if you can actually find any relationship between any process parameters and some of that. But there's no easy ones or not easy ones. It's playing around with information and see if you can find anything and 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 and, and what's good what's easy for the one is difficult for the other um, you need to realize that you actually only have a certain amount of uh, due scientific information and that can be limited as well and that that is your limited factor but that is the first thing you have i always say if you can go back to a meter by a meter information you know you might have fifty thousand uh, data points if you go back to just a drill hole you might have 100 or 50 per data point so um that is your first, so you have to understand what your meter by meter information, because you always try to relate back to some of that information for the modeling guys. Thanks, Leon. Uh, next question is, how do I know if these relationships we do find are worth using in models? Um, that is where the relationship between the processing guys and the geologists and mining guys is important. And there's a big risk in that, in the sense that sometimes in studies, they all been done by different companies or different entities or different consultants. Um, and that's why it's important that if you're in a study or in a process that you actually from the day start, understand that you have a good relationship with the other, um, what you call it, disciplines, so that when you do find some of that, that you can actually go and say, can you try this? I think that's worth it. Uh, the only guys who can really see if it's worth it is, to be honest with you, is the guy who's doing the resource model and the guy who's doing the reserve model. They're the only people that actually can tell you if it's worth it or not. Um, we can look at things in a process way and actually, you know, a process side, we can design equipment for better throughputs and things like that. That is fine. That we can do. That's not a problem. Uh, so it helps you design engineers or help design companies like us to, to design better. But if it's going to be value for MPV, et cetera, et cetera, that is very much a, a function of working together with the other two disciplines and making sure the guys who are doing the real models, even the financial guys, another, it's the third, fourth one, they're doing the modeling, and that's an important part of it. Okay, a couple more questions, Leon. Um, first one, what's, what is the best team to explore the benefits of these relationships? Uh, the best team is what I've just mentioned. It's probably depends on if the best team is always to actually incorporate into the reserve model. So um, usually 
if you your best team is probably your mining and your processing guys together, but you need the geologist to actually find if that those relationships is applicable. And I think that's important. So it's what happened is you initially will work with a geologist to understand the relationships. If you think both it's applicable, you know, then the relationship have to be with the mining guy who's doing the reserve modeling or the person who's doing the reserve modeling. If all of that is done, the next relationships with the finance, the guys who are doing the financial evaluation, because they can, you know, you have to guide them as well. And that's probably the reserve guy who's doing most of that, but it's also the processing guys, because we will give different uh, operating costs and capital costs for different scenarios, for example. Thank you, Leon. One last question. It's quite a long one. I'll try and paraphrase it. Uh, can any process or metallurgical parameters used in design be used to check for relationships? Yeah, I, as, a, as somebody who's done many, many years of research and run research teams in my life, you will try. Yes, anything is possible. Uh, you just have to understand that data is... Um, I always say statistics is as good as the one who's operating the statistics. You know, if I listen to what people say about stats, it's very dangerous. But people who understand statistical and the limitation of the techniques, if you look at statistical techniques, there's a lot of different ones and they're not all applicable. So you have to make sure that you, um, and that's why you can start off by your simple normal methods, which you think is good. And if you find something, go to the guys who understand it better and see if it's really applicable. And if it's really applicable, you can go and get it into those models. But you 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 have to understand the data and the data limitations and the statistical tools or variable or relation tools that you're using in that. But anything can go against anything. And sometimes I said you can have an excellent relationship between two things, but it's not going to help you at all. You know, it's, it's, it's for a good example to give you is, you know, if there's a good relationship between, <laughs> and, uh, for example, a hardness and quartz, which, yeah, I mean, hopefully you don't get the quads, but it, you know, it's just going to tell you what you know. In any case, you know, it's, it's, so there's some relationships it's just obvious, and, and some is, is is useful. Thanks, Leon. Uh, that looks like the end of the questions. Uh, thanks, uh, Leon, for a great presentation, and thanks to everyone for attending. Uh, on that, um, we will end the webinar, and we hope that everyone enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Bye then. Thank you. Thanks, guys.